2020 is a year that changed everything, and not just because of the pandemic. We had the convergence of three crises. Of course, there's the health crisis, which has upended the way we work together and how we engage with our customers and our suppliers. It's disparate toll on diverse communities. And there's ensuing economic crisis that's changing business plans and disproportionately impacting women and people of color. The regressive effects of the pandemic on gender inequality, by McKenzie's calculations, women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to this crisis than men's jobs. And women make up 39% of the global employment, but account for only 54% of the overall job losses. And third, there's the racial injustice crisis, which ignited a global awakening on race and privilege. The murder of George Floyd last year um, and others, they have brought about conversations about race, gender, and inequality. Um, They've brought these conversations to the dinner table and to the office, including our virtual offices, and not just in the U.S. This is a watershed moment for racial and social justice globally. Uh, So first off, you know, companies need to understand the importance of inclusion because it's integral part. It's an Mm -hmm. integral part of cultivating diversity. Diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And in order for diversity programs and initiatives to be successful, uh, these programs initiatives have to encompass engagement and inclusion. Employees that feel included are more likely to be positively engaged within the organization. Higher employee engagement drives higher levels of productivity, retention, and therefore a company's overall success. The good news is that if there's ever a time to put inclusion on the agenda, it's right now. Corporate America is being held accountable by our people, our employees, customers, and by broader society. Responsible companies are looking at this issue, wrestling with who we are as a company and what we stand for. So increasingly, you may be hearing about organizations that are no longer just referring to diversity and inclusion. In fact, let's take a step back. I would say about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, a lot of organizations were focusing just on diversity. It was like, we have a diversity committee and we have a diversity policy and a diversity statement. And then about five years ago, most organizations shifted to diversity and inclusion. And here we are now in 2021, where I would say the best practice is to embed the E into the work we're doing. And when I say the E, the equity, whether you call it equity, diversity, inclusion, EDI, or diversity, equity, inclusion, the point is adding in the E. Why do we add in the E? So first of all, let's talk about the difference between diversity, inclusion, equity. Diversity, as uh, Kim alluded to, is about the quantitative representation of difference and cultural identities. It's about the mix of people you have in your within your organization. Inclusion is about both the quantitative representation, but it's about the qualitative experience. It's about mm-hmm. to what extent people bring their whole, true, authentic selves to work, to experience belonging, and still have equal access to opportunities. Equity is about, and I'll offer you a definition. I suspect a lot of you are taking notes, and so I'll slow this down. Equity is about recognizing the historical legacies and current realities of prejudice, discrimination, bias, and more that people experience from across communities that are marginalized. So Mm -hmm. equity is about identifying how these historical legacies, current realities have an adverse impact on people's experiences within the workplace culture so that we need to proactively address the gaps, close the gaps, level the playing field. In terms of taking your initiatives global, uh, not surprisingly, the cultural and legal issues are obviously very closely connected. And some countries do permit targeted support to underrepresented minorities. But there's a lot of global variation in law and and culture, as as has been said. And we have also seen instances of backlash where the US or UK headquartered uh, companies are seen as not understanding local law and and culture. But I think to have a really effective program, it can be a marker of your identity as an organization. And and actually to be effective, sometimes it does mean you're going to have to take some legal risk. 
authenticity is the fundamental ingredient to inclusion. Mm -hmm. We cannot have an environment where people will experience belonging unless they can be who they are. So it's really important that we cultivate authentic leadership and expect authentic leadership amongst our team members. Well, I think the short answer is yes. There are one or two countries where it's mandatory, not many, but in most countries, it's best practice. There are some countries where you have to have an equality plan and training would be regarded as part of it. I I know there's discussion about the effectiveness of unconscious bias training, but at the very least, Mm -hmm. we would we would say some training is is helpful. but we'd also encourage people to think beyond training to other types of measures as as well to um, and to consult um, you know their affinity groups and so on on what the barriers are in the workplace. I just think of a couple like um, the Halo Code, which some organisations like Unilever have signed up to, which sort of highlight inclusivity around. Um, hair and dress particularly for black people so uh, it isn't just about training but training yes so you know i suspect this experience was paralleled around the world where when covid hit each of our nations whether that was november december of 2019 or january february march of 2020 organizations went into full panic emergency risk management mode, a lot of pens went down on EDI initiatives because it was the, will we have money to pay our employees? Forget EDI initiatives in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so we saw pens down. Now, for those of us who are on the front lines doing this work, we were like, do not take your focus off of EDI because we know from, for example, the past economic downturn that we saw in 2008, around 2008, that People of color disproportionately were impacted. We know that women are disproportionately impacted during economic downturns. So we were like, do not take your foot off the gas pedal, please. The impact of COVID on women and women's employment, like everything from women losing jobs to women taking um, to uh, choosing to enter into flexible work arrangements or reducing their hours or choosing to self-select out of being employed and struggling deeply to juggle family care in and, and its intersection with uh, mental health challenges. We know from countries around the world and and taking a look at some of the mental health data that's coming out, that in this moment, the groups that are having the most heightened experiences of diminished mental health are women. And in addition to youth, in addition to people of color in the context of this racial injustice uh, crisis moment, takeaways for us from a COVID reflection um, moment is that COVID is providing us with an opportunity to spotlight the pre-existing social inequities that have been been exacerbated by a health crisis. And so these inequities exist pre-COVID, but they're amplified in this moment and giving us reason to do more. Sure. Yes. Uh, I'll try to be super quick, but it's one of the constant questions that we've had over the <laughs> over the last year as people have uh, you know, struggled and recognised in particular they don't have data on ethnicity. So, yes, first of all, collect it. But what you can collect country by country will vary. In some countries, you can't ask for ethnicity data. In some countries, asking LGBTQ mm-hmm. data puts the individuals at risk. So, you know, you, you have to bear that in mind. Think what you want it for um, and why. Um, In most countries, Mm -hmm. the legal and data protection aspects are going to depend on who's going to have access to the data and what are you going to do with it. So think that through first, because the answer to the legal question, the the answer to the question will depend very much on that. Flowing from that, limits on access. Usually it's only a small group of people within HR analytics teams who should have access. Set rules on how you're going to use it. It, it, Maybe you're going to use it to analyze what happens to people at particular stages like recruitment, promotion, 
um, performance evaluation. Um, you might want to share anonymized data with managers so they can you can raise awareness about what's <coughs> happening in the demographics of their team to help better decision making. So, but, but you know, set your parameters of that, and then be transparent. Legally, you have to tell people what you're collecting and why. Um, but we also recommend, actually, because there's a lot of underreporting, in particular of some types of data, um, we also recommend actually involving your networks in understanding why you're collecting data and, and really getting their support for that. The first thing um, is it's less edgy. For me, a must do for all organizations is to create what I call either an inclusive leader profile or an inclusive team member profile okay. within your organization. It's like a one or two page document, like for my clients when I'm working with them, it's like a one or two page document where it basically sets out inclusive behavior within our organization looks mm -hmm. like these five attributes in one column. In the very next column, it's the here is what the behaviors actually break down as. So it's like very specific and granular. And then the third column, we include examples and tips and suggestions. And then what happens with this inclusive team member profile is you then, your recruitment questions, you're recruiting for these attributes when you're hiring people because we want to be hiring people who come into our organizations with inclusion as a skill set. We want to take these attributes and embed them into our performance feedback uh, processes or evaluations. We want to be measuring people's performance. To what extent are you exhibiting inclusive behavior? We want to mentor, a sponsor, coach people to embody these behaviors. So these attributes become embedded across how it is that we work. The second thing is to tie leader compensation in particular to inclusion efforts. And when I say leader compensation, I don't mean like, and then 5% of your compensation is, what have you done? Feel good for within the organization. It's like there is a, like a line item that says X amount of your, in, your, your uh, income, your bonus will be tied to what proactive steps did you take? to mm -hmm. engage in inclusive behavior this year because m unfortunately money matters and is, is, is like the stick that prods people into being accountable. Mm -hmm.